St. Paul says, faith comes from what is heard. The Liturgy of the Word is the way in which we encounter Jesus Christ in His Word that's still living and breathing and animated in us and still working and acting towards us to communicate His grace to us and His message to us still here and now and the way that we actually respond. It's a dialogue. It's the truth and the spiritual reality of the fact that the Word is not dead but alive. And the fact that the Liturgy of the Word points towards the Liturgy of the Eucharist, that it's disposing us to be able to receive the greatest of gifts in the Mass in general, which is Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. So there's a reason why we proclaim three readings. The first reading followed by the responsorial psalm, the second reading, which is an epistle, and then the gospel, following the gospel acclamation. Where do the readings come from? We have to remember that the Bible in general, both the Old and New Testament, are a collection of different types of books. It's a library that shows how God has revealed himself and how he has saved his people throughout all of salvation history. Beginning in the Old Testament, through the readings of the prophets, through the Gospels, including the apostolic epistles, everything leading up to that ultimate and final and perfect revelation in Jesus Christ. The Liturgy of the Word is a series of readings that's taken from the Bible. The first reading, for example, is often a reading from the Old Testament. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The first 46 books in the Bible, we will often see how God's laws or God's revelations were first proclaimed by the prophets, the great patriarchs. We could think of Abraham, think of Isaac, think of Jacob, think of Joseph. We can look through all these great figures in Holy Scripture. Think of Noah and how God made covenants with all of them as a reminder to say, even if my people should forget them, even if my people should break away, I never will. Having heard the first reading, we now respond through those beautiful psalms that correspond to what the first reading has been about. One thing that's unique about the Responsorial Psalm is that they were written as chants or songs. Remember your mercies, O Lord. There are 150 psalms found in the Old Testament. The psalms cover a whole variety of human emotions, rejoicing, lament, wandering. And it also expresses the words of Christ sometimes on the lips of the church. We listen to the cantor proclaim the particular stanzas with the theme of full and active participation in the liturgy. We are called to sing along with the responsorial psalm, the antiphon. Then the second reading will be an epistle a letter from the Apostles. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Often the second reading is from one of the letters of St. Paul. So the letters of St. Paul were written to his communities where he had gone on his missionary journeys. When he would leave a certain community, he would write a letter to that community to support them or to kind of encourage them to get back to the faith, or sometimes he would ask for help for another community. Some of his letters are beautiful, expansive, and very deep writings on the faith itself. Why do people read the first and second reading? And the priest or deacon read the gospel. Lectors are those who serve their community as response of God's invitation. They sit down with the readings, even pray with the readings, have encountered Christ themselves in the words that they're actually speaking. Thus says the Lord. They are excited to share that good news. The priest or deacon reads the gospel because the gospels contain the words and teachings of Christ. And since bishops, priests, and deacons are ordained in the person of Christ, it's fitting that they allow Christ to speak 
through them. What is the posture for the readings? For the Old Testament reading, the first reading, the responsorial psalm and the second reading from the Christian scriptures were seated. Following the second reading, you have the gospel acclamation, which is preparing us almost in a triumphant way to be ready to receive our Lord in the most beautiful way in which he's expressed himself through the gospel. And so we stand quite literally at attention and we pray in attention to welcome Jesus Christ who is coming to speak once again to his people. Why does the priest raise the book of the Gospels over his head before reading them? The Gospels hold the preeminent place in the New Testament because it speaks specifically on Jesus Christ and who he was, his words, his teachings, his salvific act, that he was the Messiah. It is essentially the good news. What is the reason for the homily? The homily itself is an extension of the gospel. We are living in the era of the great banquet. The homily it should always, always be drawing church, out in... what the gospel has spoken on, but to make it relevant to our lives they today. There is an expression that the homilist will have both the gospel and as well as the readings in one hand and the newspaper in the other. So in other words, trying to break open the word of God in this particular time. To help place the biblical worldview onto those who are listening to the homilist so that they could see where they fit in salvation history and where God is working in their life even now. Jesus who is God, desires to have this personal encounter with us. And then a short time of silent prayer, because silence is very important. It's how we truly hear what God wants to tell us. We sit with seeds that have just been planted in our hearts and allow it to grow and sprout. I would really say that what is paramount in the Liturgy of the Word is the word that's read to you, but even more so, your disposition to receiving the word. If we are open and disposed to receive his word, his gospel message that he still wishes to speak to us today, we then, being disposed to receive him in reality in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity, will then be enabled to go out, go forth, and to do what we're called to do as Christians and disciples, which is make more disciples, which is to spread the word of God, the good news, to share it, that same good news that we're hearing when the Liturgy of the Word is being proclaimed. After the homily, we rise, and together as a church, we say the Nicene Creed. It is a way for us to respond to the words of Scripture. We can take a look at the covenants that God has made with his people, and the creed is an opportunity for us to be able to reaffirm that, yes, we are part of this covenant. The beauty of the creed is essentially stating the fact that we share the God. same mind and heart of Christ because we believe the same thing, a belief that is truly real and that binds us together. It's also a great catechetical moment too because if someone were to ask a Catholic, can you describe to me what does it mean to be Catholic? Look at the Nicene Creed. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and we understand that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, which situates him in salvation history and global history. He died, but he also rose again. So we see that, yes, Jesus is a suffering Messiah, but also a risen Messiah. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. So in other words, the Holy Spirit, God's presence with us here on earth. Catholic Church meaning universal. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. So when we think of our loved ones who have gone before us and have gone to heaven, they have been created by Jesus. And the Nicene Creed allows us to recall that. 
What's the difference with the Apostles' Creed? One of the differences between the Nicene Creed as well as the Apostles' Creed is that the Apostles' Creed was developed earlier within church history, whereas the Nicene Creed was developed over the first four or five centuries. The idea being that it is a more fuller expression of the Catholic faith. After the community has proclaimed the Nicene Creed, we then remain standing for the prayer of the faithful. With the word of the Lord in our hearts, let us bring him our prayers this day. The prayer of the faithful follows the creed because after we state what we believe and after we've heard the things that God has done throughout all of salvation history. For all of us gathered here, may the Lord inspire us in being his missionaries of joy wherever we find ourselves. We now know today. through that belief and through that trust in him that he can answer our prayers that we now bring to him. For deep conversion to God, so the universal prayer or the prayers of the faithful are a way of expressing the fact that the Mass is a prayer on behalf of the whole world and the whole universe, really. We often pray for the leaders of the Church to be faithful to God and for leaders of countries to also allow Christ to guide them. We pray for other, perhaps global or universal events. We pray for those who are sick for those burdened by any kind of difficulty and for the local community, it's really expressing that we trust in God to care about the details and to care about specific people and issues. And the more that we express our prayers in the universal prayer, the more we exercise our trust in God and the more that our trust expands as well. And the more also that we show our love for others by praying for those who have no one to pray for themselves. We offer our prayers together, and the response is often, Lord, hear our prayer. There is always this understanding that God listens to our prayers, but God's response will be in God's time. It is a beautiful thing knowing that as the Catholic Church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, Catholic in our name, which means universal, the fact that you here are one little member of this huge, huge body that spans the entire globe now, praying in spirit for the same thing. I mean, Christ said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I. Could you imagine now thousands, millions, a billion gathered in his name, offering up prayers and petitions, not only for the church and for souls who need it, but more so for the salvation of the world. So that people who do not know Christ, who do not know his church, may hear the saving message come into the church and be saved, be received, receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Because we are literally a part of something greater than ourselves, which is what we should all long to be, but especially something that's true, 